Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. And here's Travis to lead us into a, a new series. My favorite part of this, this art's insane. I, this is t-shirt worthy. And as senior pastor of this church, I will see to it. My favorite part is the dove just, just downloading into this guy's brain. God's revealing to him, you need to get a denim jacket, and these are the patches you need to put on it. And he's like, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Lupe, thanks for leading us in Spanish. What a, what a glimpse into the throne room where every tribe and tongue will be gathered singing holy, holy, holy. It just immediately took me there and just so, so thankful that, for that reminder. Um, we are uh, starting a new series, so if you're new here, this is a good time to join us. You haven't, you haven't missed anything. Um, you're up to speed and uh, you can be with us going forward if that's what you want. Um, we are going to spend our summer looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of where we'll camp, that, and that'll be our campaign for the summer. The Bible says that you actually, as a follower of Christ, have two operating systems operating within you, and they're in conflict with one another. There's two different things trying to animate you or motivate you or move you forward. One of those things is described as the flesh, and that's not the physical body, um, but these coping mechanisms for life apart from God. Not just your physical body, but these strategies that we have for life apart from God. That is the flesh. And then you also have the spirit, which is, that's not just your spirit or a spirit, that is none other than the spirit of God operating inside of you. And these two things, it's clear, are in conflict. Galatians 5 says, so I say walk by the spirit, opt for that operating system, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. The acts of the flesh, they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I'm sure we all can find ourselves in that list. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit... When we are animated by the Spirit, what comes from our lives is love and joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and a self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us as a church keep in step with the spirit. I think we can all agree that there's been a fair amount of flesh in the last season, that the last year and a half or so have been marked by the flesh or people sowing to the flesh. So the idea was, let's go on and have a summer of the spirit then, huh? Let's sow to that and see what happens. Let's be animated, motivated, moved forward by the spirit of God, right? So we're leaning into that this uh, summer. We'll talk about uh, praying in the spirit, worshiping in spirit. We'll talk about producing the fruit of the spirit. We'll talk about discerning the truth by the spirit, the use of spiritual gifts 
by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, working, going to work according to the Spirit. So we don't want you just to think about how to have a certain meeting according to the Spirit, but really a lifestyle, Monday through Friday, walking with the Spirit. What does that look like is what, what, what we're going to be leaning into. And I felt compelled. I just thought, well, where do we start? Where do we kick it off? And I felt compelled to talk this morning about holiness. Holiness by the Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I was nervous that this would be disappointing. Like a sad way to start. Like maybe you'd be like, what, man? I thought things were going to get rowdy. I thought we were thinking outside the box. Holiness is just so inside the box. I thought you were going to talk to us about what we do, um, not what we don't do or shouldn't do. We are, of course, this summer pursuing uh, the Holy Spirit. It's not just a summer of the Spirit, it's a summer of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is his uh, full name, his Christian name, if you will. So any attempt to grow in the Spirit will obviously have us growing in holiness. Any attempt to take strides and learn to walk according to the Spirit will have us walking in holiness. And, and I, you know, that's real obvious, but it kind of dawned on me in a fresh way. What else happened this week is I saw that some of our attitudes, and I think the way that we have the work of the Holy Spirit framed up is very similar to how we have holiness framed up. But the same attitudes that come with the word holy are the same attitudes that come with the word spirit. We see holiness as optional. We see holiness as unattainable. And we see holiness as just bottom line undesirable. And if I think if we're honest about the work of the spirit, we think that that's optional. Well, it's for a few who get like really into it, right? <laughs> you know, those ones, right? Not only is it optional, it's just unattainable. Like, I can't, Travis, walk. I tried, you know. I'm an introvert. I'm not demonstrative. There's all kinds of hang-ups here. It's unattainable for me to live by the Spirit. And then bottom line, I just think it's undesirable. Like, we just don't want it because maybe we've got some bad ideas about it. So... This is where we're going to start. We're going to talk about a holy life. The command in Scripture is really clear. Be holy as I am holy. And God has communicable attributes. That is ways that we can be like him. He's gracious. He's loving. He's kind. He's kind. And these are ways that we're to reflect him. And then he also has incommunicable attributes. That is ways that we'll never be like him. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. No matter how spiritual get you get, you'll never be those things. Well, his holiness is communicable. That is, it is one of the ways that we're called to be like him. Is that we're to be holy as he is holy. So how does the Holy Spirit make us holy. The first thing I, I want to unpack or I guess address is this attitude that holiness is like optional. It's a bit extra. Everyone's got that person in their life, right? Who is just a little bit extra. Who's always asking you to, have you prayed about it? Or maybe, in your opinion, going the extra mile. And, and that is what I've noticed to be the attitude that surrounds holiness. That's kind of Green Beret stuff. And the attitude can be, hey, look, man, if you want to make your hard life even harder, 
like go right ahead. But as for me and my house, we're going to trust Jesus for our holiness. You go ahead and do that. What I want to say just to confront that lie is that holiness, not only is it not optionable, optional, it's inevitable. It's the end of this. You're being conformed into the image of a sinless man. That's where this thing goes. J.C. Ryle, he's a 19th century bishop. We must be holy because this is the one grand end and purpose for which Christ came into the world. Jesus is a complete savior. He does not merely take away the guilt of a believer's sin. He does more. He breaks its power. We celebrate what Christ has saved us from, but we also celebrate what Christ has saved you to, and he has saved you to a holy life. Corporately, this is where we're headed at the, as the church. Ephesians 5, Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or without other blemish, but holy and blameless. That, blameless, that's where we're headed. Not only is this not optional, this is in- inevitable. This is the end. And then individually, read this from Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be what? Holy and blameless in his sight. It's far from optional for us to be holy. The second thing I believe we believe just just a lie is that it's unattainable. And I think unless you see it as possible, it's like, why even try? I know that's how I felt a lot about maybe some of the government regulations this year. It's like, unless you see this as possible, why even try? And this is impossible. So often people threw up their hands. Have you ever read Jesus on the topic of holiness? When he says things like, hey, you, you, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I, said, I say don't even hate people, because if you hate people, you're, you're guilty of murder. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I tell you, even if you lust after a gal, you're guilty of adultery. I mean, it's like, why even try? I thought I had a good day. I didn't murder anyone. I wanted to murder them, but I didn't. Then you read Jesus and he's like, well, if you hated him, you murdered him. And you're like, dang it, just killed multiple people today. I give up. I thought I was having a good one. Of course, kind of the slogan of our settledness in sin is this passage that says, all our righteousness is even filthy rags. Even our righteousness, even our attempts to do good is sordid, filthy, contaminated, tainted. So why even try? All we can do is is live into our authentic messed upness. That's all we can do. The Bible talks about uh, two types of holiness, and this is helpful for us. It talks about a positional holiness that we have in Christ because of his work, and it talks about a progressive holiness that we're to strive towards. And this can be confusing. We have our positional holiness because of a union with Christ. God looks at us and he sees the righteousness of his son, and in that way, we're already holy. We have that. This is what the idea that's captured in Hebrews 10.10. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Done deal. We have a positional holiness. There's another way, though, that the Bible talks about holiness And it's this progressive holiness where we're increasing from one degree to another. Hebrews 12 says it this way. Again, this is just two chapters later for the author. Strive for peace with everyone 
and then strive for holiness. Wait, I thought we already had that. Without which no one will see the Lord. So strive, seek, work, grow in the area of holiness. This is not the language of an imputed righteousness, but this progressive holiness in our lives. And I don't know if you've ever thought this before, but like, which one is it? Have we been gifted holiness by the work of Jesus Christ that we now stand? Or are we to strive to live holy lives? And the answer is yes. Both of those things, both those things are working together. Isaiah 64 is where that passage comes from uh, that says your righteousness is like filthy rags. But let me read the whole passage and the context of it. And I think you'll see both this idea of progressive holiness and positional holiness. It says, you come to the help of those who gladly do right who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. I want to point your attention just to the first part of it. That if you do right, it pleases God. Now, I didn't go to seminary, but I think this suggests that it is possible to do right and to please God. Now, here's another idea that I think is helpful is to understand that God is judge and as a judge, you cannot please him. You stand condemned before him and the father looks at our And it's only because of Christ that we can stand before God as judge. And that's where this gifted positional holiness comes into play. But our God is also a father. And as a father, he can look at our imperfect attempts, our growth, our striving, our our seeking, and can be pleased by it. My kids, if you have young kids, you know this. When they say that their room is clean, what do they mean? It's not clean. When they say, I made my bed, you know what that means. That there was some sort of attempt at making their bed. But as a parent, you walk in and you can see their desire. You can see their attempt. You don't walk in and be like, you, you call, what, what are you doing here? call this a made bed? No, you can see their desire to please their father and that can bless you. When they draw something, you know, and it's like, it's, it's a boat on the water. And you're like, really? I did? Okay. You know, it's not like, get this out of my face. This isn't a boat, you know? Come back to me with something that looks like a real ship. This isn't seaworthy. This is a floating hot dog. Like no one does that. That's not what we do. Because we can see their desire, we can see their attempt to grow, and that blesses us. So I would, as we talk about the Holy Spirit making us holy, and we talk about our attempts and our desires to walk in holiness, I would think really more, not about status or standing. I would actually think about evidence and progress. Is there evidence of holiness in your life? There should be evidence flowing from your life that something has flowed into your life. There should be evidence of a whole. Is there evidence of a holy life? And is there progress? Do you see yourself gaining ground? As you're getting older, are you also getting holier? The last thing is that I think we see, just frankly, holiness is just undesirable. It's not what we want. 
I don't know about you, but it's never been my New Year's resolution to be more holy. It's never been it. You may have been around the church for some time. I remember singing this song that says, uh, my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do uh, your will. It's so far from our one desire, it didn't even make our top 10, did it? It was like, that was not what, what I was thinking. We want life to the full. We want to live. We want joy. We want peace in life. We want to be better moms. We want to be better husbands. We want to have an impact. We want to be transformed. We want to succeed in life. And the problem is you don't see any of those things connected to holiness. Holiness is fallen on hard times. It's just a list of don'ts for us. And certainly that's a part of holiness is, is purity, being other than, separate. But we're not just separate from things, we're separate to things. Set apart for a specific use. That's what it means to be holy. Set apart, dedicated to a specific use. My toothbrush is de dedicated to a specific use. So when my kids come and say, can I use it? It's like, no, that's used for one thing. There's a purpose for that. And it's not to clean your white vans. I brush my teeth with that. <laughs> it's got a specific use. And so, yes, holiness involves abstaining from certain things. But holiness also means engaging in certain things. And without a growing holiness in your life, you won't have life to the full. Sin deceives and destroys. You won't have the marriage you want to have without holiness. You won't have the joy that you want to have without holiness. The peace. Everything that you think you want, I'm telling you, it's connected to holiness and you had no idea. This is our picture of holiness um, I want to show what is an old Mac and PC uh, commercial. This is brilliant advertising. And I want you to notice holiness in this. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. You know, we use a lot of the same kinds of programs. Yeah, like Microsoft Office. But uh, we retain a lot of what makes us us. But you should see what this guy can do with a spreadsheet. It's insane. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, and he knows that I'm better at life stuff, like music, pictures, movies, stuff like that. Well, what, what, what exactly do you mean by better? By better, I mean making a website or photo book is easy for me, and for you, it's not. Oh, oh that kind of better. Yeah. I, I was thinking of the other kind. What other kind? The commercial starts with the guy in a hoodie saying, I'm a Mac, and the guy in a blazer saying, and I'm a PC. And I think holiness is connected to PC. It's connected to being dogmatic. It's connected to being rigid. It's connected to being uptight. It's connected to numbers. And what we want is life. What we want is to be laid back, right? What I find really interesting is that when we think of Jesus, the holiest man who ever lived, we don't think of that PC guy, do we? That's not our image of the man who never sinned. He was dangerously alive. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. How do you view holiness? Holiness has got to be for us connected to the good life or we're never going after it. 
And you need to know that it's something we need in order to have what we really want in life. So let's go for holiness. Let's go for being set apart from certain things, but also unto certain things. Let's go for, or, or I would say crucifying everything that would keep us from living life to the full. So when we go forward and we talk about your marriage, we want your marriage to be separate unto God's purposes. When we talk about the gifts that God gives through his spirit, we're talking about you being separate unto God's purpose for your life. When we say come out and be separate, it's not for the sake of being separate. It's for us the sake of a specific use. Let's be holy by the work of the Spirit. Now just briefly as we conclude, worship team, would you guys come? I want to just outline really briefly how our holiness is served by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. In fact, when Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit, he calls it the Spirit of truth. And so the Holy Spirit comes to convict, not to condemn. The conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit is very specific. The condemnation that comes from the enemy is very general. You don't have what it takes. You're worthless. You'll never get past this. These, this is the voice of your accuser. This is condemnation. Conviction is very specific. In saying this, you were wrong. You should repent of it. So if it's general, vague, and there are no steps that follow it, that's condemnation. If it's specific and you see a way to deal with it, that's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction and leading us into all truth. And we need this because sin separates. It's what sin does. So if we're talking about keeping in stride and keeping in step, we're going to have to be aware of sin because it will separate us. It'll get us off pace. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings truth. Sin before it destroys, deceives. That's how it destroys. You start buying into a lie. You start believing something long before you behave a certain way. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal what we're believing, what we're focused on, not just to call you on a certain type of behavior. One of the things that we buy into is this idea that it's not that big of a deal, that it actually doesn't affect your life, that you can sin in one area of your life and it won't affect the others. It's the Titanic myth. The idea that the Titanic was unsinkable was because it had a compartmentalized hole. So the idea is that it could take on a water in one area and it wouldn't sink the ship because it wouldn't go to the other compartments. We know how that story goes. If you think right now that you can take on sin in one area of your life and it won't spill over, that it really actually doesn't have an effect on your relationships or your connection with God, you're believing a lie, a titanic myth, and it will sink your ship, and it's the Holy Spirit that will come and will speak the truth to you, convict you, of sin. The Holy Spirit's also a master at pointing us to Jesus. He won't just reveal your sin. He won't just tell you the truth about your status. He'll tell you the truth about who Jesus is and the work of his cross. So he will reveal what needs to change in us, but then he also works to remove it by drawing us to Jesus and pointing us to the cross. He will remove sin, not just reveal it. And it, he'll lead us to Jesus. And the other thing that the Holy Spirit will do as we walk in holiness is lead us to community. There is a call in scripture, a really clear call to confess. 
to confess our sins. And it's such a helpful habit and practice to continually, perpetually confess. Well, I was raised Catholic. Yeah, I know we need more of that. We need more of that in the Protestant church. A habit and a pattern of confessing sin. Because our tendency is to conceal it, to hide it, to harbor it, to hold it, and it eats at us. The other beauty of confessing our sin is it creates community. Guess what? Your struggles are not just your struggles. Nothing you're facing is not common to man. Other people are facing it. It builds accountability and connection. So the Holy Spirit will lead us into the truth. The Holy Spirit will also lead us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will lead us into community. Would you go ahead and stand with me? I close by reading from 1 John. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we don't live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have that fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We just invite you, uh, Holy Spirit, to work. We are uh, a little bit uh, nervous. We don't want to be exposed. But we do want to be changed. And there is no genuine conversion without your conviction. So we invite you to convict us. I silence the voice of the enemy, the accuser who would want to shame and condemn, that's not gonna help us walk in the spirit, but your conviction will, Lord. So we invite your work to make us separate, to bring us out. We pray for strength to confess our sins one to another, for community and accountability to come from a whole church striving for holiness. And we just ask you right now, Holy Spirit, make our sin small in light of the cross. It feels huge. It feels insurmountable. It feels like we've been stuck in this for years. Show us the power of the blood of Christ to set us free. Show us the power of the blood of Christ to cleanse us and to help us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to lead us into more and more holiness as we move through the summer. As we worship, spend some time. You don't got to go flipping over rocks. The Holy Spirit's real good at doing his job, but let's just allow ourselves to be led into truth and be led to Jesus and led to community with one another. Let's lift our voices together and then we'll be dismissed. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time.
the grave divide.